Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books in Science, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Galina Limorenko, doctoral candidate in neuroscience with a focus on biochemistry and molecular biology of neurodegenerative diseases at the PFL in Switzerland, the host of the channel. Today, we'll be talking to Simon Baron Cohen, the author of The Pattern Seekers, How Autism Drives Human Invention. Uh, why are humans alone capable of invention? This question is relevant to every human invention, from music to mathematics, sculpture and science, dating back to the beginnings of civilization. In the Barton Seeker, uh, Seekers, uh, Simon Baron Cohen, the director of the Autism Research Center at Cambridge University, presents a new theory of human invention. His unexpected claim is that understanding autistic people, specifically their unstoppable drive to seek patterns, a characteristic of the condition, is the key to understanding both the ancient origins and the modern flowering of human creativity. In The Pattern Seekers, Simon Baron Cohen's goal is twofold. To provide an answer to the long-standing question about human invention and to understand the role that autistic people played in the evolution of human invention. His higher message is to change the way our society views and treats autistic people. Among the new generation of hypersystemizers will be some of the great inventors of our future. If we acknowledge that some autistic people were and still are the drivers of the evolution of science, technology, art, and other forms of invention, their future can be different. I'm delighted to welcome Simon to the show. Well, Simon, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to have you here today. All right, so I would like to start by asking, um, so as we're living through these unprecedented times during the pandemic, how has it affected you and also your work? Yeah, so um, I'm a psychologist and I work at uh, Cambridge University at the Autism Research Centre. And well, you know, uh, in March 2020, we had to close our research centre and move to working online. And I'm, you know, I'm very pleased that my team were able to make the adjustment. Um, You know, we do a, a range of different kinds of research. But nowadays, we have to just do research that doesn't involve direct contact with uh, autistic people. So it's mostly kind of indirect. Um, So either analyzing data that's already existing or using online surveys, a range of different methods. But we've had to adapt just like uh, the rest of the world. Yes, that's a really big, big issue uh, that academics face and not uh, uh, just in uh, psychology, right? So do you think, are there any plans to make adaptations to see the patients? Uh, Well, you know, now that we've got um, a few different vaccines, we hope that, you know, the end of the pandemic will happen this year. Um, You know, I'm optimistically thinking about the summer, so that in the second half of this year, we can go back to a kind of, um, you know, how, how life used to be. With, uh, with social contact and direct contact with autistic people, you know, in terms of uh, the work we do. So, um, you know, for now, we just have to stay, stay safe because we're still in a dangerous time. Yes, that's a really great message. Okay, so could you tell us more about yourself? Yeah, so I'm uh, a psychologist, as I mentioned. I, I've been working in the field of autism research for over 35 years. And in that time, uh, both the methods that we have available for research have changed a lot. And also autism itself, you know, how we think about it, how we define it, uh, how it gets diagnosed, uh, that's also changed a lot too. So for me, it's been a, you know, really um, wonderful journey. And over those years, or even decades, I've had the the privilege of working with very talented students and uh, and a research team. So I've been able to go deeper 
and broader to understand, you know, what causes autism and also what might help for autistic people. Thinking about the early days, how did you get interested? Were there any people who inspired you? Um, Oh, yeah, lots of inspirations. But, you know, in practical terms, I started as a teacher in a very small unit for uh, autistic kids. This was in uh, the 1980s when we didn't really know much about autism. Um, So the inspirations back then, well, the first was the head teacher of this unit. You know, she's a wonderful woman called June Felton. Um, She's now retired to living in Jerusalem. Uh, But back then she was just kind of, she had an open mind, you know, that autistic kids, you know, were coming to her school, coming to the clinic, but nobody really knew like what they needed um, and, you know, what kind of education, uh, what kind of support or indeed what's causing it. But she had a kind of mind where she was just willing to explore. She had a video camera in every classroom so that she was filming every interaction between the teachers, the teachers and the kids so that at the end of each school day, we could we could look back at the videos and see what worked, but also see what didn't work. So kind of learning through practicing, through through trying. Interesting. And it's really inspiring uh, to hear that your teacher was really the driving force uh, hmm. um, in your journey. Um, yeah, exactly. Do you have any advice to, do, uh, or to our young early career researchers? Um, well, research is, you know, it's difficult because you have to pick one problem to try to understand. Um, and often, you know, the nature of research means that it can take a long time to get the answer. So you have to have uh, incredible patience and persevere. And often there are lots of challenges along the way. Either there's not enough money um, or other practical, you know, uh, obstacles for completing the research. So, you know, it takes a special kind of persistence. But I guess my kind of advice for um, a young researcher is, first of all, pick a question or pick a a problem that really fascinates you. Because if you have the curiosity and the fascination, that will kind of keep you going, even when you hit, you know, bumps in the road. Um, And, you know, just kind of follow your interests, follow, follow your passions. You know, people say this almost like a cliche, but I think it's really important that if you're, you know, if you're sort of, if you're doing this um, and getting a lot of pleasure out of it because you really love the work, you love, um, you know, the the question that you're you're trying to answer, uh, then in a way, you know, you know, it, although it's work, it's it's also just fascination. Uh, it can turn into a lifelong career, as it has done in my case. That's great advice. And I suppose the intrinsic motivation will also keep you through yeah. the adversity like pandemic. Exactly. exactly. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. Okay. So can we start the discussion about your book? Mm. But first, could you just give us a description of what is actually uh, autism and how the definitions have changed? Because as you mentioned, yeah. you know, once it started in the 80s, it was slightly different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so autism, uh, we, we sometimes call it a neurodevelopmental condition. So that means that um, it starts very early. Uh, it's developmental. So it starts in early childhood. And the research is now suggesting it starts even before birth. Um, because we'll talk about genetics and factors in pregnancy later. Uh, but by the time the, the child gets the diagnosis, what you see in terms of behavior is social difficulties, communication difficulties, uh, and what's sometimes called repetitive interests and very narrow interests. Uh, So that's autism. And um, it's about 1% of the population. Ideally, people get their diagnosis in childhood, but many kids get missed. So they may not get their diagnosis till teens or even adulthood. Um, And in terms of how it's changed over the decades, we used to think it's very rare. So when I started, the statistics were four in 10,000. Today, we think it's very common. As I said, 1%. Uh, 
Um, also, we've broadened the definition because in the old days, we tended to only see autistic kids who also had learning difficulties and language delay. But today we see autistic people with average or even above average intelligence, so no learning difficulties, and with very good language. So, you know, so we have a much broader spectrum, as it's called. Um, And the other thing that's changed is kind of recognizing that many autistic people not only have autism, but they have co-occurring conditions. For example, they might have autism and ADHD, attention and hyperactivity disorder, or autism and epilepsy, you know, or autism and dyslexia, you know, a, a whole collection of different things. So, so we have to kind of realize that autistic people are not all the same, um, you know, that different autistic people can have a real, very different profile to each other. I suppose the last thing that's changed is that we used to think autism was much more common in boys or in males. Uh, And now we're seeing more females coming forward for a diagnosis. So there still seems to be like more males than females. But the difference in that the sex ratio is not as extreme as we used to think it was. Yes, and with 1% of population being affected, it's a very big number. It is. I mean, some people will say 1% still sounds very small. But you mm. know, 1% of, for example, uh, the UK, so you know where I live, would be equivalent to 700,000 autistic people. You know, it's a lot of people, and that's just in one small island, uh, let alone if we think about this as an international or, or global minority. Yeah, so we can, we can see that it's really important to research it and look into it in detail. Yeah, exactly. And as our understanding is evolving, um, your book sort of makes its way, way here, really uh, trying to focus on, uh, um, on explaining some of the aspects. So how did you come to writing this book? Why now? Right. So, I mean, I guess the other thing that's changed over the last you know, 20 or 30 years in autism research is that um, there used to be a focus mostly on things that autistic people find difficult. So on the disability side of things. And now what we recognize is that autism isn't just about disability. It's also about strengths and even talents. And this book is very much uh, a celebration of some of the strengths in autism. So the book covers two different processes in the mind uh, or in the brain. Uh, One is empathy, and I talk about the empathy circuit, and that's the area that autistic people struggle with. So imagining what someone else is thinking or feeling, being able to read their facial expression or their vocal intonation, to um, try to imagine another person's intention and their thoughts and their, their, their feelings. But the other part of the mind that this book looks at is what I call systemizing. Uh, So I look at a mechanism called the systemizing mechanism in the brain. And this allows humans to look for patterns. And so my new book is called The Pattern Seekers. And this is the kind of positive side of autism I wanted to explore. Because autistic people seem to be very interested in patterns in the world. Um, patterns in nature, patterns in mathematics, patterns in music, uh, patterns in kind of doing experiments, um, you know, just kind of understanding how things work, discovering the rules, if you like. And uh, what I do in the book is look at both of these mechanisms, the empathy circuit, which seems to be um, underactive in autism, and the systemizing mechanism, which seems to be overactive in autism. But we, I, I look at both of these mechanisms in the general population to, to reveal how actually autistic people are different, but they're not necessarily inferior. They're just different to other people in having this very different profile 
in some environments, it does become a disability, especially when they're expected to be very sociable and very flexible in interactions with others. But in other environments, this can be a real strength, a real asset. You know, if you let autistic people do what they're good at, you know, looking at the detail of how something works, looking at looking at data, um, or doing tasks that are very repetitive so that the rules and the patterns become very evident. Autistic people can be, you know, um, can be can, can function at a higher level than most people. And then the other big thing that I look at in my book is whether there's a link between autism and the capacity for invention. So humans seem to be the only species, I argue, who, who can invent not just once, but invent all the time. That seems to be what, what Homo sapiens does. You know, if you look around in where you're sitting right now, your room is filled with inventions, not just modern inventions like your computer, um, but even ordinary inventions like furniture. You know, you're sitting on a chair, you may be sitting at a table or looking out of the window. The window itself is an invention, you know, and this is what humans have been doing for, I argue, almost 100,000 years. We've been inventing. And part of why we can invent and other animals can't is this systemizing mechanism. We have to find the patterns and then we have to play with or, or experiment with the patterns. And the evidence I, I kind of lay out in my book is how if autistic people are above average, in finding patterns, in understanding patterns, and in being attracted by patterns. And if that's also the basis of invention, well, then autistic people right through our evolution, back 100,000 years, have likely contributed to the history of invention, the evolution of invention. And so I explore this idea, and I, we could talk a little bit more about it. Yes, for sure. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, so one of my questions uh, was, so, okay, so this is perhaps quite a trivial difference, but is there a difference between pattern seekers mm. and pattern seers? Oh, yeah. So whether their patterns are there, but not something that you look for. Mm. So you're right that some patterns are easier to, to spot than others, easier, mm. to, easier to, to recognize. Um, you know, if you have, um, I don't know, a simple pattern, let's say a string of numbers where they're just increasing, you know, uh, in, in size, or maybe, you know, a string of letters where they're following a very easy pattern like alphabetical, you know, then most people will spot the pattern. But some patterns are a bit more complex where you have to look a bit harder. Uh, and, you know, whether you call that pattern seeing or seeking, I don't know, but I think autistic people, the evidence suggests autistic people are better at spotting the pattern, simple or complex. You know, they, they just naturally look at the world in terms of what's the pattern, um, and they, you know, they find it, and they, they I think they also get some pleasure out of the patterns, because patterns you know, makes the world more predictable. You know, one, mm. one, one of the things about the social world and the world of empathy is it's very, it's very difficult to find any patterns. You know, in conversation, we don't say the same things over and over again. In relationships, we don't do the same things over and over again. You know, the, you know so the social world is all about, it's very unpredictable. And that's why we need a different brain circuit the empathy circuit to navigate the social world. But in the world of music and mathematics and engineering and nature, you know, there are lots of repeating patterns and they're highly predictable once you spot them. You know, it makes the world um, kind of almost safer because you know what to expect. Yeah, very interesting. So uh, there was an argument that... Um... Autistic people, as, as you mentioned, um, sort of it, it has been driving human innovation for hundreds and thousands of years 
in the early societies, people like shamans perhaps could have uh, had a few of these traits or? Yes, exactly. So, um, so I look at the archaeological evidence. That's one part of my book, uh, mm-hmm. The Pattern Seekers. And um, the archaeological evidence, what, what I was looking for is when did, when did invention begin? You know, when do we find the first evidence for an invention? And I think it's around 70,000 years ago when we see the bow and arrow. That's one example. Um, and then we also see the first jewellery, which is a necklace that's been found. Uh, we also see, sim- at a similar time, about, about 40,000 years ago, we see the first musical instrument, which was a flute. Um, and we see, around 70,000 years ago, the first engraving. So, you know, taking a sharp instrument and making patterns on rocks. Um the first counting around 40,000 years ago, uh, the first sculpture, the first paintings. You know, so suddenly humans were inventing at a tremendous rate. And it's all happening at around this time, 70,000 years ago, roughly. Um, and you were asking about shamans, I think. You know, mm-hmm. th- that if we think about pre modern, you know, pre industrial society, if we think about, you know, traditional. Um, communities and uh, hunter-gatherer communities. It's true that you know sometimes there would be somebody in the tribe or in the community who was respected because they could see patterns. It might have been herbal medicine, for example. So advising people that if they eat this plant or that plant, it might be a remedy for this kind of illness or that kind of illness. You know, these are all about seeing patterns between one thing and another. And, you know, these people might have been given high status as having wisdom or knowledge because they could see patterns, uh, patterns that were useful. Particularly, uh, you know, an, an example might be medicine. Um, so, you know, th- these things are kind of a bit speculative. The, the archaeological evidence is a bit more solid where you can really look to see, is it the case that there was any evidence for invention before Homo sapiens? And I think it's, you know, there isn't much. We can look at living species. So we can look at humans versus other animals today, chimpanzees or monkeys or birds or whatever. And in my book, I also look at that kind of evidence. So that's called comparative psychology, where you compare across species. And again, it doesn't really look like other animals, even, you know, apes and uh, monkeys understand uh, patterns the way we do, particularly what I call if and then patterns. So if is when you take something like an input and is where you do something to the input, usually something causal. And then is when you look at the output, what what do you get? And uh, this seems to be the kind of logic that's in the human brain, if and then, which we don't see in other living species today or in earlier uh, species in uh, in evolution. Interesting. So are there ways to test this if and then pattern, either in humans or in animals, so we actually know? Yeah. Um so so we've we if we now focus on you know the modern day um mm-hmm. you know we we use a, a questionnaire as one way which is um it's called the systemizing quotient and it asks you how easily you can identify these kinds of patterns like patterns in mathematics patterns in music patterns in uh physics patterns in cooking you know, all kinds of patterns in the world. And autistic people score higher than non-autistic people on this questionnaire. So do um, people working in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Maybe no surprise, but that means that people who have an aptitude in STEM um, are also, you know, very good at this if-and-then 
reasoning according to the questionnaire. And what we also find in a very large study, uh, 600,000 people took part, it was an online study, is that people in STEM have more autistic traits than people who don't work in STEM. So this again gives us a a clue that uh, if you're talented at understanding systems, at this if-and-then logic, uh, there's also a link to how many autistic traits you have. You know, the idea is that we all have some autistic traits, but some of us have more than others, and people with an autism diagnosis have a much higher number. But there's this kind of link that we're seeing, and I explore in the book, a link between autism and the capacity for invention. Or, you know, that people who are good at inventing, good at understanding systems and then modifying systems to to innovate, to create new systems, they also seem to either have a higher rate of autism or a higher rate of autistic traits. Interesting. So um, if we look at this, some of the arrival arguments uh, yeah. to, uh, for the human invention, so what, what are they and why they don't hold up to scrutiny? Okay. Um, so I suppose one rival argument might be that the reason we can invent is because we have language and other, mm. an, and other animals don't. But what seems to be clear is that even in humans who lack language, for example, um, people who've had a stroke and they lose their language, they can still invent. And there are some examples that I, I look at in the book of, for example, musical composers who lose their language because they have a stroke in one part of the brain but they still continue to be able to compose or to create, invent new music. So that would be one example. And a second example would be, um, again, from autism, that some autistic people have very little language, maybe even no language at all, and yet they can, uh, they can recognize patterns, they can change patterns, uh, they can invent. So in the book, I talk about uh, autistic people who, again, who are fantastic at music, even though they may have very little language, or fantastic at drawing, you know, coming up with originality in art, again, with very little language. So language by itself doesn't seem to be enough um, of a kind of uh, precondition for Invention. Obviously, language gives us all kinds of benefits. I'm not wanting to um, diminish that. You know, once you have language, you you can use it for self-reflection. You can use it to teach other people, uh, to share. You know, uh, whatever you you make. So it allows for cultural transmission. But just the uh, the simple idea that language is necessary for invention, I think we can sort of rule that out. So as we see more people in STEM subjects with autistic traits, uh, do we see higher acceptance, perhaps? I yeah, and, yeah. Hmm? I see what you mean. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, some companies who hire um, people who, you know, partic- because who hire people in STEM, um, I think they, um, they recognise that often aptitude in in stem comes hand in hand with a high number of autistic traits and instead of um i don't know seeing this as a problem or a challenge they're actually seeing this as something to um something to embrace uh and you know that they might need um adjustments or you know changes to the workplace so that someone, for example, who has a diagnosis or who has, um, you know, who struggles with their autism can still make their contribution to the workplace. Um, So there are companies that are increasingly saying, if an employee has a lot of autistic traits or has autism, you know, that needn't be a barrier to them being um, a full member of the team, making their contribution. But they simply need to ask the person, you know, what do we, what do you need? How can we make 
the workplace more comfortable. And often it might just be small things. You know, for some autistic people or um, people with high autistic traits, they might just want to work away from other people in a quiet room instead of being in a very noisy sort of multi-user room. For other autistic people, it may be that they just want to be allowed to do the work and not have to socialise at lunchtime or after work. You know, so just removing that expectation. Uh, for others, they may want to, I don't know, they may want to wear headphones because they find background noise uh, too distracting. So, you know, these are kind of simple accommodations that employers can make to enable autistic people or people with a lot of autistic traits to be at work. And that's good for many reasons. One is that many autistic people are unemployed. So it's good to kind of reduce unemployment. And a second reason why it's good is it's good for society. You know, that if we have autistic people or those with other disabilities kind of outside of work, you know, we're not really... Um, we're not really promoting inclusion. And inclusion is just a really important um, ethical set of values of making sure that nobody is left out, that making sure that everybody is is welcome at work or in education, um, you know, irrespective of, ha- of how different they are. Yes, and there are some uh, really good uh, neurodiversity neurodivers- initiatives from the companies or institutions. So can you define what does this new, well, sort of novel tor- term neurodiversity mean and uh, what the brain types uh, exemplify it? Yeah, sure. So neurodiversity is a word that um, is now being used more and more, and I'm really pleased about that. Um, you know, we know about um, other kinds of diversity, like biodiversity, when we think about nature and the climate crisis the importance of of just looking after the diversity in the pla- in the planet in terms of animals and plants we know about gender diversity making sure that all sectors in society are equally accessible to women and men and we know about ethnic diversity although you know as we as as we we saw last year with black lives matter uh, there are still many areas of society which are um, in which black people and other other ethnic minorities are underrepresented. But anyway, at least these are kind of familiar concepts. But this idea about neurodiversity is something relatively new. And it's the idea that we don't all have the same kind of brain. You know, that there are many different types of brains in society, in, in, in the population and that we should celebrate the differences and make space for these different types of brains. Um, And in my book, The Pattern Seekers, I talked earlier about these two mechanisms, the empathy circuit and the systemizing mechanism. And what we do is we kind of divide the whole population according to their scores on uh, empathy and systemizing. And that that reveals five different brain types. You know, one brain type we call type E, because people's empathy is better than their systemizing. Another one we call type S, people who whose systemizing is better than their empathy. There's a third kind we call type B for balanced, where the person is equally good at systemizing and empathy. And then the last two brain types are extremes extreme of type E are people who empathize all the time, but their systemizing may be just average or below average. And the last one is extreme type S, people who are looking for patterns all the time. So extreme systemizers, but their empathy may be again average or below average. And that seems to be where most autistic people lie. So this gives us a a way of talking about neurodiversity five different types of brains. Uh, it it uh, encompasses everybody. So you and I are both somewhere in this space, but we might have different profiles. And the idea is that, you know, society, companies, you know, 
our world, our communities, we need all of these five types of brain. You know, they, the individuals with these different profiles make different kinds of contributions, and we need we need them all. But we shouldn't just assume everybody is the same, or everybody should aspire to be the same. So when it comes to invention, which type do you think is much more likely to be involved in this process of inventing? Right. So so I've already kind of explained that for me the basis of invention, this if and then pattern seeking, um is much more common in people who are type S, they systemize, or extreme type S. Mm-hmm. Um so that would be about uh thirty to thirty-five percent of the population. Um and then the thing is these are the individuals who may come up with the invention, but they're not necessarily the people who will take it to the market. They're not necessarily people who can um, who can sell the invention or who can raise the, the money for the invention, you know, to, uh, to, to translate it. So, you know, we need, you know, in, a, in any company or any workplace, we need a team which includes very different skills we need the inventors, the systemizers, but we also need the empathizers, the people who with the good communication skills who can go out and, you know, explain and and uh, persuade and uh, communicate the idea so that um, funders, for example, will get interested or the general public will see the value of it and maybe buy it. So, you know, it's not it's not like um just one kind of person is involved in invention you know it becomes a kind of team effort but maybe the original idea is likely to come from a systemizer so can we draw any parallels with the extroverts and introverts so for example somebody who is high on empathy are they more likely to be extroverted or systemizers who are on the very extreme ss end uh, can they be a bit more introverted um it doesn't always follow so mm-hmm. you know extroversion and introversion is a you know it's another model about personality it's quite an old model uh systemizing and empathy is almost like a new model uh, and they don't fit onto each other they don't map onto each other closely i mean it's true that many autistic people also feel introverted they, they might avoid other people or uh, struggle with communication or making friends, but equally you can find some autistic people who are very extrovert, um, uh, but they might, you know, have difficulty in judging what is socially appropriate. So they might be very extrovert but say the wrong thing, um, or they might not understand why did a re- relationship go wrong uh, because of difficulties with with empathy. Um, but you know. I don't think we can see a very straight, a very simple um, link between invention and introversion. Yeah, and here um, I really like that uh, you really provide a new, a new extra dimension to uh, all the complexity of, of uh, the human uh, brain and uh, our. Uh, yeah, I suppose. So we have. Can I say? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we so we have this idea that you know some inventors are very solitary. You know, they stay in the basement of their house or in their garden shed, and they're doing their experiments, looking for patterns, trying to understand how something works, or trying to improve a system. You know, um, and this may the, the, this picture may suggest an introvert, but I think you know um, the more important sort of quality that an, an inventor has is that they love patterns, they love experimenting, um, and they repeat their patterns over and over, but they systematically vary the patterns to see if it's leading to an improvement or not. And that might be true, you know, for someone who's an extrovert or an introvert. Could this be uh, taken for obsession? Yeah. So, you know, when we come back to autistic people, uh, one of the kind of symptoms in the diagnosis is, is what you call obsessions. And again, for many years, you know, many decades, really, uh, obsessions in autism were seen as negative. 
you know, that they were preventing the person from being flexible, preventing them from having an open mind, that they just pursued one topic or one activity over and over again. But what I argue in my book, uh, The Pattern Seekers, is that actually this is a very positive quality. It's a difference in how autistic people uh, learn. So it's their learning style is to repeat, to see if you get the same result every time. And then, you know, um, to start making systematic changes to a pattern. So you take parts of the pattern, but just change one piece, one variable to see what's the effect of that. And so, you know, and, and this is this is what scientists do. This is what inventors do. Um, this is even what, you know, what great artists do. You know, they repeat over and over again, but just changing small details to see if it improves what, 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 what came before. And um, rather than sort of thinking negatively and calling it an obsession, maybe we should just uh, recognize it as, you know, this is how the person processes information in the world. They do it, in, you know, very deeply, very carefully with a lot of attention to detail a lot of repetition but it can it, the result can be a fantastic piece of music or a fantastic new device uh you know like um i don't know the smartphone it didn't come out of nowhere it was the result of you know a long time a long period of repetition and experimenting to improve on the previous uh the previous version I'm really glad that you mentioned this uh, value judgment that can be sort of imparted on the, on on these people uh, being really focused on something and being called obsessions. Yeah. So perhaps these the so-called um, obsessions are possible for people because they don't actually have the in, inner value judgment. So you just do it. You yeah. don't quite yeah. whether it's. Uh, Use, useful, useless? Yeah, I think that's right. You know, that the person themselves may not hold those value judgments. They're just getting on with uh, with experimenting with patterns. But I think equally important is that those around them should also not have, you know, value judgments. You know, hmm. if you, you, know, if you have a, a colleague in your office or a child in your class who seems to be very obsessional because they're you know experimenting over and over again with just one thing you know if 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 everyone around them just lets the person do it and just says well you know this is just how he is and let's see what comes out of it rather than sort of dismissing it or stigmatizing it or or describing it pejoratively you know often that person can flourish and can show what they really can do and sadly, that doesn't happen enough. You know, many autistic people, for example, um, get bullied at school, verbally or physically. They're made to feel uh, that they're inferior or broken or damaged in some way. Many autistic people end up dropping out of high school without, you know, qualifications, even though they've got good intelligence. Uh, and many of them develop poor mental health. Because if you if if people are always, I don't know, making fun of you, or making you feel inferior, you can start you know ending up with low self confidence. Many autistic people have depression and anxiety, and that's you know that's really, it's not fair. You know we shouldn't be doing that to autistic people, but also it's not part of autism. If society was treating autistic people fairly and better. Autistic people would have good mental health, and they would they would be staying in the education system, and you know they would be finding jobs. But sadly, the opposite seems to be true. Yes, that's uh, that is uh, quite sad, and um, perhaps part of uh, of the reasons of very very small part of the reasons can be due to misunderstanding of actual mind and thinking of these. Uh, of these people so how can we start understanding the minds of the hyper systemizers yeah so you know in in my book you know i spend some time kind of you know looking at what do we mean by hyper systemizers 
you know, looking at the genetics, looking at the neuroscience, looking at the psychology. But equally, I spend quite a bit of time just kind of telling stories about autistic people or hypersystemizers and, you know, re- revealing sometimes the tragedy of their lives, of how badly they've been treated or how much they've been trying to fit in, trying to get a job, but not getting any success. And, you know, what what would we need to do? This goes back to what we were discussing earlier. What would we need to do to make our school system more autism friendly or our workplace more autism friendly? So it's almost like uh, the book is also, um, you know, it's like a call to action. It's asking society to change the way we do things, you know, not to look at the child or the the person down the street in negative terms because they don't socialize, uh, but to look at them as just different and look for what they can do. What is it? What is their strength? Because every everyone has a strength. If you kind of if if you nourish it, if you give it space to come out, and how can you you know how can you welcome that person into your community, into work, into school, so that they can uh, they can show their strength and uh, and fulfill their potential yes of course it's really important and uh, diversity and neurodiversity and inclusion within any society mm. so can i ask that, uh, have you ever encountered non-autistic hyper systemizers oh yeah absolutely and this is very important mm. that although autistic people may be hyper systemizers you know you meet you meet hyper systemizers who don't have a diagnosis um, they might have a lot of autistic traits, but they may not need a diagnosis. Uh, and that may be because they've found a niche where they can work quite happily um, or they're with colleagues or with family or with a partner who just accepts them for who they are. You know, people might think they're a bit eccentric, you know, because they think differently. They have, they have a different way of doing things. They may not fit into cultural conventions or follow the fashions, but they haven't got a diagnosis and they're they're functioning well because they found a niche. So, for example, you know, if someone is, you know, who loves somebody who loves mathematical patterns ends up in a maths a mathematics department in a university, their colleagues might just value them for being good at mathematics and not worry about their social skills or the fact that they um, dress with strange clothes um, or don't join them for lunch. And because they're accepted and valued, they don't end up with a crisis, a mental health crisis. They don't end up looking for a diagnosis or wondering what's wrong with me. They just they just get on with it and they feel content. So this, this makes us realise that um, the whole business about diagnosis really depends on not the individual, but those around him or her. You know, whether people are being supportive and accepting or whether there's a kind of uh, a clash between the individual and their surroundings where people are, you know, saying um, you don't belong or making making the person feel they don't belong. Yes, and this also uh, strengthens the argument that uh, making accommodations in schools or in offices or uh, at higher education for autistic people will actually inevitably make the environment better for everyone else who might have these traits. Exactly. So the or even just everyone else. Even what? Uh, just everyone else. <laughs> yeah, everyone exactly. So I think it changes the way you know it changes our mindset. That once we start thinking in a more inclusive way, it's not just good for autistic people at work or in education. You know, it's good for any kind of diversity. And um, we talked about different forms of that. Um, so in a way, it's making society more equal, more ethical. Um, and it doesn't have to be, these these changes don't need to be expensive. It's more kind of, the, more about how we think about um, you know, the diversity in classrooms or in the office, rather than, um, you know, needing uh, very different infrastructure. 
So can you tell us a bit of a, a bit about challenges that uh, prevent integration of autistic individual, individuals or people with uh, autistic traits right. in, in the way we like? Yeah. Um, so for me, I think the biggest challenge is probably about funding. So when we look at, um, in my country, the National Health Service, um, so this is kind of, you know, clinical services for people with disabilities, including autism. Uh, often there's just not enough funding. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where you're located, um, which country you're in. Uh, Switzerland. In Switzerland, yeah. And, um, and, uh, and again, you know, every country has a different kind of health system. But certainly in the mm. UK, you know, the UK, you know, spends money on some areas of medicine. Uh, spending a lot of money on the pandemic at the moment, but autism is still underfunded. So that means that there are not enough clinics to get a diagnosis. And even when you get your diagnosis, often there's nothing after that, no support. You know, so we're talking about challenges. And I think for for autistic people, one very practical challenge is, you know, how accessible is a diagnosis? If you need one, you know, can you get one easily? And what I see in our health service is long waiting lists. Sometimes you have to wait six months or a year to be seen by a psychologist to get a diagnosis. And then even after you get your diagnosis, there's no kind of uh, autism service that's in your local area to give you the support, you know, to either either, you know, in school or at work or with with um you know um i don't know making friends feeling mm. feeling included in 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 the world or with mental health so so this is kind of you know it may be better in some countries than others and we're starting to do some research across europe to see what it's like um but certainly in the uk it's still it's still very difficult so does this condition and uh, also autistic traits uh, run in family. So do you foresee something that as a predictive test or screening at the very early stages of child's life being useful to get the diagnosis? Right. Uh, autism does run in families. Um, mm -hmm. So we said earlier that, you know, the, the rate of autism in the population is about 1%. But where there's already one child in the family with autism, the chances of the next child also having autism is much higher. Uh, it could be as high as 20%. So this suggests, you know, genetic factors. And indeed, a lot of genes are now being identified in association with autism. So, um, and we haven't found all of the genes. We've only set, found a, a small fraction of them. Um, but you're asking whether in the future there could be like a genetic test which would mm -hmm. which would predict autism um i don't think so i mean i'm glad you're asking about genetics because you know when we when we think when we look at this question of is there a link between autism and invention uh what we did was people who score high in systemizing we looked at their dna their genetic information and compared it to autistic people and found a significant overlap. So, mm. so in you know, even in the genetic in information itself, you can see a link between autism and systemizing, which I think is the basis of invention. Um, but I don't think there's going to be a genetic test for autism, um, either very soon or perhaps ever. Because of what we were saying earlier, that you could have genes giving you a lot of autistic traits, uh, a, you know, a strong capacity to systemize, but it doesn't mean you necessarily need a diagnosis. You know, if you found your niche, if you found um, a job or a community where you fit in, and where you're accepted, then your mental health might be good. And you might not be struggling, you might be flourishing, and so may not need a diagnosis. So genes by themselves won't be enough to say this person will need a diagnosis. It all depends on 
you know, their social support. Um, so do you think that providing the spotlight of, of how autistic people and hyper systemizers are contributing to our society? So are you hopeful that this will make the foster the conversation in our community to be more accepting and to really think about it? Absolutely. So, you know, one of the reasons I wrote this book, it's partly a contribution to psychology um, and neuroscience and understanding why humans are special you know but it's also a book you know for for different different at different parts of society for politicians for teachers for um people who work in the health service or social services you know many different areas of 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 our society to to think differently about autism um you know, so the book is written in a kind of very accessible way, I hope. Although it's scientific, it's so-called popular science, and it may, and it brings out the, the, the societal relevance. Um, so I hope that the book will be kind of changing the way policymakers think or changing the way a head teacher thinks and so forth. Um, you know, in that way, it's meant to be a book to promote social change. Excellent. So that's exactly what we need. <laughs> Good. Well, Simon, we've taken up a lot of your time. So can you tell us what are you working on now? Uh, well, actually, you talked about genetics and we're just about to start a big new project to collect DNA from tens of thousands of autistic people because the, the understanding of the genetics of autism still needs kind of um, a lot more research. But, um, but, you know, that's just one aspect. We're also very interested in uh, what can we do about mental health uh, in autistic people? How, what kinds of support would improve autistic people's mental health? So lots of different research projects, um, still kind of interesting to me, uh, still exciting to me, even after all these years of... Uh, of, of of being in this field yeah that sounds, sounds really exciting project yeah so uh, where our listeners can find more information about your work and the book right so the book of course is available on amazon so it's called the pattern seekers it's published in the uk uh, by penguin random house and in the us uh, by basic books uh, but in terms of our research People can just visit our website, which is autismresearchcenter.com. Excellent. Okay, so thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for the conversation.